We'll go ahead and jump in. Hey everyone, thanks for joining us today. Uh, really, really appreciate it and hope everyone is having a fantastic day so far. Um, I'm gonna be talking a little bit about, we'll introduce ourselves in a second here, but just in general today, we'll be talking about the in-store environment, how that's changing, what is what the future of that looks like, um, and really talking about how non-endemic brands can leverage the in-store environment too. Um, what is pretty interesting is that you're seeing across the board here, not only with ourselves, but with other uh, in-store media formats that non-endemic brands are starting to leverage the space quite a bit. And we'll talk into a little bit what that looks like and the best use cases that we've seen, um, and, as well as some opportunities that we think for, for the lot of you here that we have for, for in-store media too. Um, just to start off, I'll, I'll start with some introductions. We have uh, obviously myself, but, but Raj here as well from Vistar Media. Raj, would you like to give an introduction for yourself? Yeah, thanks, Nolan. And big thanks to Grocery TV for having us be part of this. Um, as Nolan mentioned, I'm Raj Lala from Vistar Media. We are the leading global programmatic ecosystem for digital out of home advertising. I've been here a little bit over eight years now, and it's been incredible to see some of the advancements made in the space, especially when you look at in store as a medium. So excited to be here with you guys and, and dive in with you all. Yeah, awesome. And, and likewise, Raj, huge thanks to Vistar for joining us today and, and for yourself for joining us today, too. Um, yeah, and it's great to meet everyone. If, if I've not met you yet, my name is Nolan Johnson. I'm the director of ad partnerships here at Grocery TV. I've been here for about five years um, and have pretty much worked with, across a bunch of different brands, um, both endemic and, of course, non-endemic for this environment. And so I'll be sharing a little bit of, of my experience in this space as well and, and where we see it going. Um, so just in terms of what we're going to cover today, we'll talk about why the store is really emerging as an ad medium itself. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about, obviously, how you can launch an effective and uh, digital at home campaign, whether it's tar targeting, creative, or measurement. And then, of course, at the end, we'll do a Q&A as well. Um, depending on timing, I can't promise that we're going to be able to get to all the questions, but please submit uh, via, via the Q&A, and we'll be able to, to answer those at the end, too. Um, so taking a step back for a second, so obviously, we're going to talk about where the store is going to be going, but... We need to talk about where it historically has been, right? So the store is now emerging as an ad medium for especially non-endemic brands to lean into. And the reason that it hasn't been really considered as a medium before is because it's been pretty limited, right? This is what in-store media has typically looked like. It's static, it's low impact, little visibility. Um, obviously it takes a long time to plan and you need to plan by individual location to location in order to get the physical assets there. Um, and oftentimes it's promotion-based. You see that a lot of the branding here is things like special offers, low prices, buy now. Um, and for that reason, a, a lot of non-endemic brands um, have not leaned into the in-store environment, but all that's changing because this is what the in-store environment is looking like today, right? You have engaging large format displays that you're able to actually see the video content that you maybe you're running across other different channels live in store. Um, you have dynamic creative that's responsive to real time. Raj will talk a little bit about that later. Um, you can transact just like you're buying online media or video media, whether that is through programmatic channels. Um, as, and you have the ability to target in real time as well and go live with the campaign at a moment's notice. Um, so all of these are reasons that a lot of in-store, a lot of brands are leaning into the in-store media and why that's becoming a, a channel in its own right. And most importantly, it's designed for storytelling, right? It's designed for the brand building. It's designed to be able to reach consumers in a high impact environment where they are already shopping and they have purchases on their mind. And so it gives the op perfect opportunity for, uh, for non-endemic non brands to really lean in and reach these households as they're going through there. Um, and for that reason, we really view ourselves as three different types of media channels kind of combining together into one, right? You have the mass reach and video extension of TV, and obviously with the decline of linear, these uh, the household decision maker is becoming a harder to reach audience. And um, in-store media offers that capability given where it's located in the community. You have the high impact and contextual relevance of digital out of home and the brand safety that comes along with that. And then as I mentioned before, you have the audience targeting and transactional ease as you would have for online with partners like Vistar and other programmatic channels that are able to actually give you access to these in-store environments too. Um, and for this reason, the, the digital in-store environment itself is uh, really, really busy, as you can imagine. Uh, in fact, 85% of total sales still occur in brick and mortar stores. So when you're thinking about, you hear a lot about like either that's grocery delivery or you hear about online online sales, stuff like that. 85% um, of those, those uh, grocery sales are still happening actually in the physical store itself. 70% 
of the stores have a larger audience than what you'd consider like a retail media. Um, so you're still seeing that the vast majority of shoppers still prefer to shop in person. Um, and you have 75% of, of shoppers shopping at least once a week, at least in the grocery environment. Uh, and, you know, we're not the only ones talking about this in terms of the store emerging as an ad channel for both endemic and non-endemic brands. Um, Insider Intelligence talks a lot about this recently, talking about how reach and frequency um, can, can still be a very, very effective metric for in-store media um, because of the fact that you have millions of consumers going through these stores every day on a, on a national basis. Um, and for this reason, you have the grocery store really be the center of the community, but retail in general is there's so many different touch points to reach household shoppers across the board, right? Um, what is interesting is that the same people that are making a lot of these purchasing decisions throughout the retail community are the same people that are making the purchasing decisions for non-endemic brands, right? So these are the same audiences that are going through and, and reaching the people that are choosing which credit card they use, what bank they're going to partner with, what entertainment brand they're going to watch when they get home or streaming service, what kind of insurance they're going to get, what kind of car they're going to drive. These are all examples of decisions that these household shoppers are making. Um, and they're all, this is the same audience that's actually going through the stores across the board. And what's great is that you have the ability to reach the shoppers, not only at the center of the community, whether that's at a location like a grocery store, but also that these shoppers are shopping everywhere else. And so as you're buying digital out of home campaigns, you have the ability to target shoppers throughout their journey, throughout different components of the, the stores itself. Um, you're seeing 43% of shoppers actually use mobile banking to access their accounts. So there's a good opportunity for brands to leverage um, their, their new mobile, mobile banking app to get further adoption there. 84% are going to malls um, and 67% are even going to big box stores as well. So you're seeing cross shopping happen beyond that. So the reason that I'm bringing all this up is that there's a lot of opportunity for brands, to, uh, especially in the non-dynamic space, to lean into these shoppers to make sure that you're hitting them while they're in the middle of running errands, while they're actually um, you know, in that buying mindset and, and at a place that they're frequently shopping itself. Um, and because of this, we're seeing that grocery stores are also pretty recession proof, right? Um, you have a lot of economic uncertainty right now in the marketplace. I think we're all feeling that. I think that we're all seeing that and reading headlines. Um, and for us, we have the ability to make sure that we're reaching shoppers regardless of um, what that economic uncertainty has. In fact, you see, for example, for grocery stores, you see that grocery store uh, shopping actually increases during a recession, given the fact that the number two budget that's being cut by a household during these, these times are typically dining out. Um, so you have the ability to make sure that regardless of what's happening in the environment, you're reaching consumers on a consistent basis. Um, and so now I'm going to have Raj talk a little bit about how programmatic plays into all of this from a, from an in-store perspective, too. Yeah, thanks, Nolan. You know, and while Visor has been around for 11 years and consistently growing, we've seen over the last couple of years a massive acceleration in brands adopting and wanting to activate digital out of home programmatically. So, so why is that, right? So first coming out of the pandemic, there was this appetite to reach people outside of the home again. Um, but it was met with some hesitation, right? Because brands were not ready to fully commit back into a strategy like that. So the quickness and flexibility of programmatic out of home offered brands and agencies the ability to stay a little bit more nimble. Um, and in addition to that, not only doing that across outdoor formats, right, but really start scaling their media across play space and in-store mediums as well. Um, in addition to that, you know, brands couldn't rely on just consistent or routine patterns of behaviors that consumers used to have, right? That was all thrown out the window and, and really shifted to highlight the importance that things like audience targeting and creative messaging can kind of bring to the table. And lastly, the ease and seamlessness of considering out of home as an extension of all your other digital media. Nolan had noted this, but just the simple ability now to use a platform like the Vistar DSP or Trade Desk or Google or Yahoo, um, you know, it made it really easy for people to consider out of home alongside their display, mobile and video buys as well. So let's get a little bit more specific now um, and talk about what does it actually take to launch an impactful and effective in-store campaign? What are some of those higher level questions you should be asking yourself? So it always starts with defining your audience and targeting strategy from the beginning. And I think this is where the out of home industry has, has really changed, right? Because historically out of home was about choosing your real estate, owning that real estate and running at a constant loop at one said location. But now brands were able are able to take a more thoughtful and data-driven approach into how they go about 
selecting that, that media. So just going through some of these higher level pillars, right? When you're considering in-store media as part of your strategy, what are you ultimately trying to achieve? Who are the people you're trying to target? How do you want to differentiate yourself from your consumers? And we'll talk a little bit about creative messaging in a bit as well. Um, what are the locations your audience are going to visit? So thinking about the contextual environments, there's a wide variety of both indoor and outdoor formats that you can tap into programmatically, which are the ones that are going to speak to your consumer the best. Um, determining the type of data you want to use. I think, you know, in our experience, and Nolan can probably back me up on this, in talking to out-of-home teams, they historically weren't asking the questions on who are the data providers being used on the digital side? How can we bring that to out-of-home? But we've come a really long way. So whether it's using the same data providers that you might be layering on to a display or mobile buy and bringing that over to out of home. Maybe it's a first party data set or tapping into the variety of different third party data sets available. These are all now actionable from a digital out of home and in-store um, uh, capability. And then lastly, just where you want to activate. I think given out of home used to be a tactic that brands would consider in top tier markets we have scale in all 210 DMAs when, when you look at coverage. So how can we take your test budget or your campaign budget and really make sure you're making an impact on where you want to be and not spreading yourself too thin? So going a little bit deeper, uh, Nolan's going to touch on some of the vertical specific questions and angles you can take when it comes to the in-store environment. Yeah, thanks, Raj. So there's a lot of different brands that are really leaning into the in-store environment that we're seeing on our end. And I think Raj can back up really across out of home and in store across the board. Um, but it's all about thinking about how shopping behavior is connected to that actual in store environment, right? So there are some brands that are, that make a lot of sense for this um, beyond just the audience play, where the as I mentioned before, these are the same household decision makers that you're reaching uh, and on a frequently on a frequent basis in the in store environment. But for example, someone like finance. You have consumers that will be spending money and using the card inside the actual retail environment. So it's a great opportunity for brands to be able to leverage that kind of environment to make sure that they are thought of as top of mind when the consumer gets to the checkout. But also you have that buyer that's actually in a buying mindset. They're the ones that are there that are thinking finance is top of mind. If you're like me, every time I get in checkout, I'm always like, man, I did not plan to spend that much, but here I am, uh, swipe my card, tap my card and, and, and go on. So. You're thinking about different ways that, that finance brands can really own this moment for to really think about like how shoppers are thinking about finances or, or buying and how you can leverage your brand in that moment. Um, with telecom as well, you have consumers that are walking around, they have cell phones in their pockets. I never leave my house without mine. I'm sure most of you don't either. Um, and you have the ability to think that, okay, the shopper is there, they are interacting with their phone probably while they're shopping. Now they're going through, they're being exposed to different ads. So you have the ability to talk about either A, the ability to you know maybe bundle different telecom providers, service, other areas that you have, conquesting, competitive conquesting with this audience while they're in a shopping mindset. And obviously they're gonna be returning home as well. And, and with work from home being so, um, so common and consistent, you have the ability to make sure that every time that they're going shopping and they're thinking about the different to-do list check items they have, that your telecom brand is, is in that moment as well. Um, with insurance, there's a lot of endemic actual uh, uh, tie-in to what the shopper is doing. Number one, again, beyond the audience is that you have shoppers that mostly use vehicles to go grocery shopping. So you have the ability to make sure that, that your touch point is measured to consumers either right when they get out of their vehicle or maybe right as they're going back to their vehicle um, as an opportunity to make sure that your uh, different insurance providers about like bundling, whatever that might look like, pricing um, is right there for consumers to be able to hit. Um, you also have the ability to make sure that you're hitting that shopper right before possibly go home, right? And so that, that conversation continues when they get home um, you have that ability to make sure that you're influencing what that conversation looks like with other primary household decision makers in the household. Um, and then beyond that, if you're like me, I watch either like TV or videos every time I eat dinner. And so it's a great opportunity for entertainment brands to really lean in and say either, A, you know, what are you doing this weekend with the family? Go see a movie, go watch this on, on, uh, on Hulu or a streaming service. Um, or you have the ability to make sure that you're reaching these shoppers every time before they're about to go home to say, what are you watching when you're cooking? What are you watching when you're when you're eating, like you have the ability to make sure that the shopper is top of mind or your brand is top of mind in front of these shoppers too. Um, and so for that reason, you see a few different non-endemic marketing strategies that we're seeing across the board itself. And 
And this is pretty ubiquitous depending on the brand itself. But uh, number one is definitely like increasing market share, new, new store openings. You can really activate in key DMAs um, and you can activate on a, on a rolling basis. So if you want to target certain areas within DMAs or certain locations, you can do that and have creative that actually reflects the, maybe the, the, the most recent location that you're trying to hit. Um, we see a lot of these with when it comes to like app downloads, subscriptions, other different types of media to make sure that shoppers as they're going through, again, they will have their phone right in their pocket, the ability to drive either that immediate download or make sure that when you retarget them later on that they've at least been exposed to your brand as they've been going through their day to day shopping. Um, you can build that brand affinity and recognition uh, rate, rate when they're, uh, again, either finances are top of mind or the audiences are in that brand safe environment. Um, you know, brands can really lean into that trusted feel that a grocery store has. Um, and really another big one is growing awareness of seasonal offerings, right? So like you have that ability to make sure that your any seasonal offering that your brand has or any key temple event is being felt by that audience because they're going to be going to the store on average multiple times a week. And so you have that ability to make sure that you're hitting them consistently during these big key temple events um, and make sure that you're reaching them in an effective way. For us, you know, we consider ourselves obviously a, a pretty premium in-store format and we're expanding what that format looks like. So the way that we're tackling a lot of these is that at the front end for Grocery TV, obviously that, that's been our core products across the board. You have that ability to ha have multiple touch points with shoppers, not only while they're walking by that aisle, but while they're standing in lane, you have that captive audience as they're standing there. Um, you also have the entrance. So you have the ability to make sure that you're hitting shoppers as they're walking in or out of the stores and making sure that they're actually able to be exposed to that ad. Again, um, even sometimes a larger screen display as they're walking into that store itself and and really focus on utility too, right? So if, if the, the screen has utility like circulars or coupons underneath it, for example, um, or even, even any sort of sanitizer, you have the ability to make sure that that brands are able to, or consumers are able to actually use the products itself. Um, and then, of course, for pharmacy too, really long dwell time, specific type of consumer set um, that you're able to reach and a, a specific type of mindset that you're able to leverage uh, as consumers are going through there. So we're seeing that in-store in general is changing a lot. And, and for us, we think that the future is going to look a lot like this, where you have the ability to make sure that you're reaching shoppers throughout different areas of the store itself. Um, so now Raj is going to talk a little bit about how you can leverage your targeting and creative to be most effective all, in, in the in-store environment too. Yeah. So as we've all kind of noted, targeting and creative capabilities have come a really long way when it comes to out of home overall, and especially within the in-store environment. So we're going to just touch on a wide array of different parameters you can use when you're thinking about planning your media, and then also share some tips on approaches you can take. So looking at a breakdown of the wide variety of different data approaches you can take, there are so many different starting points you can have when it comes to digital at home and in-store. And I think it's important that across all these factors, it all ties back to location. So whether it's basic parameters like demo or income or age, right, that you can use for planning, um, very a very popular one is personas or behaviors, right? Using visitation to specific types of retailers or businesses to best define your audience is a very sound way to go about you're out of home and in-store media planning, but that always doesn't fit the bill, right? You have to think about other ways you can tap in and get more granular. So that's when we can look at things such as purchase-based behaviors. So looking at households that might have purchased specific CPG products um, or a vehicle to identify certain in-market behaviors. Uh, viewership is also a really popular one, as Nolan noted, with the rise of entertainment advertisers coming to the table beyond the big vanity plays and wanting to take a more targeted approach. So how can we identify those cord cutting households, the ones using specific apps or watching certain shows? Um, really cool ways you can really lean in, identify those households, and then understand where they're spending their time throughout their environment. And then lastly, B2B is also popular, um, you know, targeting people based on job vertical, um, decision-making roles or a certain size company. And lastly, first or third-party data, right? If we don't, if we can't tap in through one of these buckets, if you have a third-party audience or preferred vendor you're working with, or even your own set of loyalty data that you want to onboard, we make that all possible to ingest it, translate it, and make it actionable from a digital out-of-home perspective. So 
Kind of beyond that, there also are some really simple tactics that you can take into consideration, and they might seem like table stakes, but they can be really powerful when it comes to in-store media. So whether that's just tweaking your messaging based on the time of day, day of week, um, a specific zip or market with a different message, or surrounding certain points of interest or POIs, right? Uh, whether that's your retailers or competitive retailers, um, there's a lot of cool ways you can tie both targeting and creative together to make the ultimate impact. And dynamic is also a new way to do this, which we'll touch on a little bit, that kind of uh, takes advantage of some of the most advanced capabilities available in the space today. So first and foremost, you know, we've been harping a lot on advanced creative capabilities, and it's an area at Vistar we've stressed and focused on and developed over the last several years. But we've kind of taken a step back to really focus this year on harnessing and not underestimating the power of good creative, right? You can have the most advanced targeting, um, the perfect measurement tracking in place, but I think we can all agree if you have bad creative, your campaign is likely going to fall short of your expectations. So first and foremost, context is everything. Um, a reminder that you don't have to be a product sold in a store to create contextual relevance. So if you are a financial brand advertising in a grocery store, why not speak to the consumer when they're in that moment and in that mindset? Um, and I think from some of the studies that we've reviewed together, contextual relevance can greatly improve the effectiveness of the overall campaign, noting here that by over 17%, if you could just even make that slight tweak and copy to speak to the consumer in that environment. And I think with relevancy in mind, let's talk a little bit more, more about dynamic, which is you know one of the most advanced ways you can bring the power of data and creative together to make every ad you serve as relevant as possible. And DCO and dynamic has been popular for the last several years, right across other mediums. You have been able to do this in a one-off capacity when it comes to digital at home and in-store. But at Vistar, we've really focused on how can we help brands and agencies do that at scale and universally across all the variety of formats. So here's a really cool example to um, within the in-store environment on how you can really take your creative to the next level, right? Whether that's swapping a specific product or offering based on weather, um, you know, increasing buzz and urgency based on countdowns or launch announcements or, you know, the latest lottery amount. Um, there's a lot of cool ways to really draw consumers in and, and create that urgency. And the third is data as creative. And sports is an amazing example of this. We've seen a lot of the big sporting leagues leading in, um, whether that's putting live scoring or countdowns on screen, um, driving tune in intent, and really seeing this expand beyond just, you know, live data um, and maybe incorporating elements like social and other things that brands are utilizing in other mediums and spending a lot of money and resources on how can we help them take those and make them actionable in the world of out of home as well. And then lastly, kind of when you're talking about targeting strategy, I think retargeting has been a really key piece in our ability to have a seat at the table when it comes to all other digital mediums, right? How can we activate a campaign in store with you, capture the consumers that were exposed to those ads, and then help you retarget them on channels like mobile, display, video, and audio? And the beauty of this is you can activate this however you want, whether that's in a direct capacity or through a DSP. We can capture those IDs, push it to any DSP you want to repurpose, or even use for custom attribution purposes. So, a lot of advanced ways that you can have out of home, have a seat at the table, and we'll touch on measurement and how we kind of um, provide accountability in a little bit. But before we do that, I, uh, Nolan's going to touch on some some vertical insights uh, to keep in mind when you're considering the, the in-store environment. Yeah, totally, Raj, and, and thanks again for going through that. Yeah, I think one thing that's really interesting with the dynamic in sports, too, that I would add from our end is that we've seen brands really leverage the role that in-store media has in, in a community. So, for example, I'm just talking anecdotally from my perspective, like for, from the grocery store being at the center of the community, you have a lot of those hometown fans that are going there that might even be planning for these some of these tentpole events, right? Like you go shopping for groceries to throw a Super Bowl party or to throw a big game party. Like you have all these opportunities to make sure that brands are, are again, top of mind while those consumers are going through there. Um, but just talking a little bit about Grocery TV's audience from our perspective and, and what we have going through there, um, we have a lot of interesting stats when it comes to some of the non-endemic brands and the ways that non-endemic brands can target consumers. Uh, number one is that we have over 105 million monthly visitors that 
that, um, that actually uses smartphones. So um, basically consumers that are going actually through there actually have a smartphone with them. Um, you have 100, 101, monthly, or 101 monthly visitors for the internet um, that use the internet to search in the past month, which obviously isn't too surprising if you consider how, how often consumers are going through that. Um, and 94 million monthly visits that with people that actually use the internet for social networking. Um, so it's a big opportunity for brands like apps to, to lean into it. Um, and the same financial behaviors are seeing from the audience as well, right? Um, most of the visitors that come through there are in a household that actually makes investments um, or use a credit card in the past three months, which is big. Uh, of course, for those to do credit cards as well as banking opportunities, you can split creative, um, which Raj obviously mentioned on it from a creative perspective. It's a good way to make sure that you're reaching audiences that both maybe leverage credit card usage or maybe don't. Um, and then you have 73 million monthly visits to have the internet and apps that are used for banking, which again is a little bit lower than I think that um, most brands would want. And so you have the ability to make sure that you're reminding consumers of app downloads as they have their smartphone and in their hand itself. Um, and for entertainment too, right? A lot of users that are looking at streaming and, and actually using, using streaming content, which I don't think is too surprising for anybody, as you can imagine, uh, cord cutting is continuing to increase, um, but also seeing that a decent amount also stream music, right? So you have the ability to make sure that if you're a music streaming app, you have a shopper that you're, that you're reaching might not only be going through the store itself and have an ability to, to influence what they listen to as they're doing their shopping, um, but also have the ability to listen to, for example, what they're going to, what they're going to listen to when they go home or a podcast to listen to as they're cooking dinner. So you have the ability to make sure, again, that you're reaching these shoppers at these pivotal points. Um, and you have uh, 26 million monthly visitors that actually watched or download a movie right in the past month too. And so you have the ability, if you're a streaming service, obviously leaning into that, but also um, movie studios, again, is a big one for us too, that have actually, you know, run a decent amount. And because of this, you can really pair digital in-store with a lot of the other channels that you're using to, to ultimately drive the results that you're looking for, right? You can engage the household consumers multiple times a week while they're in a buying state of mind using the in-store environment. Um, obviously, there's a bunch of other different formats that you can use, like billboards, for example, as they're making their daily commute, as a reminder for a lot of these shoppers. Um, of course, with TV, you have the ability to re-engage them and expose them to the ads that they had earlier. Uh, and, that, and that transfers to display and mobile as well, especially as Roz mentioned, with the ability to be able to retarget these exposed audiences, you're getting that frequency that brands need to be able to drive brand value and drive ultimate results too. Um, beyond that, just out of home in general drives a lot of online activation. And so um, as you're considering this as, your, as part of your buy, it's important to remember that consumers do take actions after being exposed to out of home. Um, a lot of these also, you know, 41% of people use a search engine pretty soon after, after being exposed to the out of home set, 33% are using social media um, and, and visiting a brand's website. You have 19% downloading an app. Again, I think based on creative, you have the ability to either drive immediate demand or at least drive exposure. So as an app download prompt happens later in the funnel, you're able to get that download and that conversion. Um, and 20% are making an online purchase almost immediately after being exposed to out-of-home ad as well. And so you have the ability to make sure that your brand is top of mind as consumers are going, whether that's an endemic brand or a non-endemic brand that they can be purchasing to. Um, so talking a little bit about that, Raj is gonna lean back in, talk a little bit about how technology um, can measure campaign performance and, and the way that Vistar does that as well. Yeah, so I, I think some of the points that Nolan just highlighted are, are really uh, good takeaways to have, right? Because I think historically, it's been a huge gap for out of home sitting siloed from an accountability and measurement perspective. Brands would invest in it and not ultimately know what it's doing for their ROI. So now you can kind of see out of home go beyond that awareness bucket. And I think it still is one of the best awareness drivers um, when you are considering media, but really kind of see its impact across the funnel, right? Whether that's from awareness, top line lift, consideration or brand affinity um, or consideration for your product. And then even from a conversion perspective today too, right? Actually measuring sales lift, store lift, um, site level activity, um, and even foot traffic. So that kind of brings us to the digital out of home measurement suite we have available today. Um, so when you when you look at that across the ecosystem, we've worked diligently with a lot of the leading third party measurement providers in the space to figure out how to best apply some of those methodologies for digital out of home media. So Nolan, if you could flip to the next slide, we can kind of run through this short list of some of the most popular measurement studies being executed by brands today. So probably the most popular and 
the one we see scale across many of the programs with first time uh, advertisers testing in store and digital out of home are brand studies, right? How can we break out performance by venue and show you lift and awareness consideration purchase intent. Um, but we can get deeper now, as I noted, right? Foot traffic is also popular through leading providers such as Foursquare and in-market nine decimal to show you after in-store or out-of-home exposure, foot traffic to your retailers um, or store visit rate and breaking that out also for you by venue, by medium. And then probably really closing the gap. This is something that we've really seen scale the last couple of years is tying back out of home to true ROI, whether that's from an online conversion perspective, um, actually measuring users visiting your site, signing up on an email form, converting with a purchase or an in-app download behavior to really give you that holy grail of end-to-end -end from an outdoor medium to an actual action. And then lastly, sales. Look, this is somewhere something we've really seen more endemic brands, right? Like CPG brands lean in, but also uh, from auto auto providers and other big organizations that we can actually track back on a household level um, if they ended up converting after their after they were exposed. So a wide variety of different measurement offerings um, that you can kind of bring to the table for any first time digital out of home activation. And I think also, what does this do for you, right? You execute a campaign, you have some real results, and this helps you improve and continuously optimize your media so you can continue to see growth. And we have some amazing stats kind of backing this up, right? Whereas over 80% of the clients at Vistar who have leveraged both an audience solution and a measurement study came back to execute a future program. And from those future programs, we saw a significant and continued lift across a lot of those brand metrics. So let's take a look now at an even more specific example um, from, a, from a fintech company, Betterment, which some of you might be familiar with, right? Who was looking to test digital out of home from a cross screen perspective um, and not only measure it from a top line when you look, you look at awareness and consideration, but also getting really granular and wanting to know, okay, after seeing these ads, did people actually go to our website and, and take an action? So they targeted professionals aged 25 to 54 with an higher in, uh, income higher than 100K. Um, they had a wide variety of formats from outdoor billboard and urban panels um, to indoor from sports entertainment to convenience and grocery. Um, and something else they did, which I noted on creative, is they really spoke to key moments on a market level, right? So when the Super Bowl was happening in key markets, they made sure to speak to the consumers during those games. Um, if another big event was happening in another market, they really adjusted their copy to speak to the different environments to make it as relevant as possible. And lastly, they captured all that exposure data. We shared it back with them, and they were able to retarget consumers with secondary messaging. And ultimately, what do the results look like? We saw a 65% lift in awareness overall, over 130% in consideration. Um, and then on some of those more lower funnel, mid to lower funnel metrics, 117% lift in account uh, open intent. Um, and then also from a hard visitation perspective, seeing a 56% lift in web actions. So, you know, we've seen the, this success story replicated across a wide variety of verticals. So if anyone's interested in kind of learning more or understanding best practices um, across some of those non-endemic groups that Noel and I have touched on, please get in touch. And we're happy to kind of dive in and, and share more with you. But I know we've said a lot, so I'm going to I'm going to pass it back to Nolan to, to kind of just wrap us up and, and talk through some key takeaways. Yeah, totally. So, yeah, thanks. Thanks again, Raj. And, and as Raj mentioned, please reach out to us if you have any questions about either campaign examples, studies, anything that you want from us. Um, let us know. We're happy to help. But just as, as far as like a recap on, on what we talked about today, um, digital in-store out of home is, is an audience based medium and it has massive reach. As I talked about, most of this of the purchases happening um it, it are happening in store right and so like while you're seeing online continue to grow um you're still seeing that the, the majority of consumers still prefer to actually shop in line and so your brands can make sure that they're leveraging that in-store medium and that in-store moment um and that programmatic advertising is a big component of that right um as you're seeing more and more brands lean into digital out of home in a programmatic standpoint and and even digital video teams leaning into digital out of home um it really does offer that high impact uh, and flexibility 
uh, as well as that advanced targeting that brands are looking for. And you're seeing that a lot of non-endemic shopper behaviors still connect back to that store environment, right? You can think about the way that this is a key shopping point in, in any consumer's weekly uh, to-do list and, and, and a weekly set. So you're able to make sure that you're hitting these shoppers again um, with your non-endemic brands that tie into other areas like what kind of car they're going to get into after they leave the store, or what they're going to watch when they get home, or what kind of conversations they're going to have with their household later on. And then, of course, you can also have that audience targeting strategy. Um, and and as, as Raj mentioned, you can have demographics targeting, consumer targeting, um, lifestyle behavior, viewership. I mean, there's so many different targeting segments that you have. If you have specific examples or specific audiences, come and talk to Raj and I. We can help you plan with that and help you make sure that you're leveraging the most that you can get out of it. Um, and then creative is, is really big, right? You need to make sure that you're running creative that looks good, um, either whether that's an extension of what you're currently running online or, uh, or in video and you want to bring that into the in-store environment, you can do that. But as Raj mentioned, even if you have the ability to target specific environments and have contextually relevant creative for that, it really does lead to a, a meaningful lift and impact. Um, and you can pair this all with your other targeting mechanics that you're going after, right? Like if you're targeting other media like TV or billboards or mobile or whatever you're looking at, in-store is such a great way to tie that together because of the fact that it is a highly frequent, frequently trafficked environment and trafficked almost exclusively by household decision makers. Um, and really from that perspective is the reason that you can hit all parts of the funnel. So you bring that brand awareness consideration set uh, inside these consumers, but ultimately can lead to conversion as well. So beyond that, um, I, I know I, I mentioned some Q and A's and we have some questions coming in here. So I'm gonna go ahead and, and, and stop sharing my screen and we can go and dive into that. Um, so one is how do you see digital in-store converging with other channels like TV? Um, so it's a pretty interesting question that we actually get quite a bit. And the way that I'm seeing it is that as linear TV continues to decline, you're seeing CTV increase in, in, in interest of course. Um, but what's interesting is that obviously CTV has a lot of its own issues and a lot of its own problems. And so as digital buyers continue to lean into the space, they're looking for that mass audience and reach from an in-store environment. And the fact that our in-store environment actually provides that, you're able to reach these, these key household decision makers on a weekly basis, allows brands that are typically investing in TV for that reach and frequency to be able to still make sure that they're hitting the reach and frequency needs that they have through the in-store environment. Raj, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, no, I think you're spot on. And I think, you know, the last few years, brands have really leaned into CTV and, you know, in my opinion, have overcorrected in some some capacity, right, and going all in where we're now kind of seeing them reach back, no pun intended, to to other mediums like in-store to really expand out, not only from a uh, differentiation from a touch point to reach them, but also from a pricing perspective. I think there's a lot more efficiency when you think about um, where some of the rates in online and CT have gone and what you can actually get from, a, from an in-store capacity. Yeah, totally, totally agree there too. Um, another question that we have is how long does it typically take to create and launch a dynamic digital out of home campaign? Raj, do you want to take that one too? Yeah, no, it's, it's a good question. And I think first and foremost, one of the main benefits of programmatic is allowing for those quick activations to happen. Literally, if you do have creative, you have a strategy in place, you can get a campaign live within 24 to 48 hours. I think with dynamic, you want to be a little bit more thoughtful, take some planning and time in that in that process and loop us in so we can kind of help guide you. I would say four to six weeks is a good timeline to kind of set for yourself to really plan out a dynamic campaign where we can work with you, your creative agency or your strategy team and all come together to design a dynamic template, understand what are those components you want to be part of that template. And then have every party take on the workload that best fits your setup. I think it changes based on the brand and the agency. So just know that our teams are there to kind of help fill that gap um, to help you bring that to life. But four to six weeks is kind of a safe timeline from that perspective. Yeah. And, and, and Raja, one, one other question that actually fits in with this is that someone asked, um, how many different creatives can you run uh, when, when planning a campaign? Yeah, I would say from a non-dynamic perspective, like, you know, you can run as many as you want. We usually recommend if you're running a variety of contextual environments or venue formats, having the creative speak to each one of those formats, right? If there's a time or day component, right? Those are all little tweaks in copy. And, you know, you could have 20, 10, 20, 30 iterations. Those are really easy to support. I think when you start thinking about 
you know, localized advertising or franchise advertising or really diving in granularly um, where you could have hundreds or thousands of creative, that's where the dynamic solution really comes into play, right? Where we can work together to design one template and you know, based on the zip or the location or the trigger, um, that content will be auto updated. So I know a lot of the creative teams we worked with have uh, been singing its praises due to like the, uh, the, the minimal trafficking they really have to do for, for some of those buys. Awesome. Thanks for that. Um, there's another question that we got here. It said, with pharmacy, how do you see healthcare providers using this space? Um, yeah, I think it's interesting because I think in-store offers a lot of, obviously, solutions for a lot of different providers and a lot of different healthcare clients as well. Um, just when you're thinking about the audience itself throughout the entire store, you have that ability. Obviously, in the, in the pharmacy space, you have an ability to make it very endemic um, to the space that they're in. So if they're waiting in line and you have a healthcare provider that wants to be top of mind as a consumer is standing there, it's a great opportunity to target them. Another way that I would say that we've seen healthcare providers work with us, for example, and, and Raj, I would love to hear your perspective too, uh, is that you can actually take point of interest targeting too. You can do this in Vistar as well as working with us is that we can make sure that you're in a certain radius of pharmacies too. So even if the store doesn't have per se a pharmacy display or even a pharmacy in them, you'll often see that the majority of, of stores will actually have a pharmacy within a local radius of that. And so you can leverage that kind of point of interest targeting that Raja mentioned earlier as a way to make sure that you're creative and, and your clients are in the right place at the right time. Yeah, I think healthcare is a great example to just kind of speak to some of the nuances that make out of home a medium that people really find trustworthy. I think healthcare is always tricky when you look to one-to-one -one or more granular targeting where you see a lot of these brands lean into TV and now out of home because it's a medium that a customer has to choose to engage with, right? And I think that builds that trustworthiness of them, you know, wanting to learn more as a follow-up and creating that as a key touch point. And I think we're seeing a wide variety of healthcare brands lean in, whether that's OTC, um, insurance or even RX brands. And I think some of the regulatory stuff around RX has been super interesting, but there's a lot of cool ways you can go about uh, compliance from an out-of-home perspective. So um, if anyone has questions on best practices on how to leverage things like QR codes or redirect URLs, um, so your out-of-home ad doesn't need to be one scrolling ISI uh, disclaimer, uh, definitely ways to, to incorporate that as well. Yeah, it's a great, great point, Raj. And we're also seeing that pharma is really starting to lean into this kind of space. So, um, yeah, that's a timely, timely question. And thanks for, thanks for asking. Um, okay, we can probably take one more here. Um, what do you think the future of the in-store environment looks like compared to where it's at today? That's a good question. And honestly, I think it's, it's, there's a lot of different outcomes that could happen. I think one is I think that you're going to see further diversification of displays in the store itself to really touch on the consumer moments. I think that for a lot of the brands that are looking to leverage, uh, or, or a lot of the, excuse me, retailers that are looking to leverage in-store displays, I think that adding to the customer experience as opposed to causing friction to the customer experience is going to be incredibly important. Um, brands and retailers need to still make sure that they're keeping their customers happy while also making sure that they can hit them with relevant messaging in the right moment. Um, I don't know if you'll see something like a Times Square of the grocery store where every single wall is covered in displays left and right. Um, I think, again, that would be interesting to the shopping experience, but I really see that that in store the in-store environment is really going to continue to, to really leverage displays that enhance the customer experience as opposed to maybe getting in the way of it. Um, Raj, I don't know if you have any thoughts that you want to add on that for our last question. No, I, I'm just excited to see how the space continues to innovate. I think grocery TV has especially done an incredible job more recently, kind of leveling up and, you know, offering a wide variety of different touch points in the in-store environment. And I think you, you hit the nail on the head. It's like, how do you create that balance of, you know, being there for the consumer, but also giving them them space and not being intrusive to the shopping experience? I feel GTV has done a good job of that compared to some others. So excited to see you guys grow and about our partnership and, and where we can take things from here. Yeah, likewise. Um, well, unfortunately, everyone, we are at time. I see that there are some more questions here. If you want to send an email to us, uh, my, my email is nolan at grocerytv.com. Raj, if you want to share your email too. Yeah, just Raj, R-A-J at vistarmedia.com. Perfect. Um, thanks everyone for joining us today. Raj, thank you and Vistar Media for your partnership and for joining us. Um, it was great chatting with you. And yeah, if anyone else has any questions, I want to dive into anything specific that we talked about, please reach out to Raj or I. We're, we're happy to help. Thanks, Nolan. And thanks everyone for joining. Awesome. Thanks, everybody.